Before I get going, I wanted to tell you a bit about Richard. And I know, I know you know him and you love him, uh. but I'm going to tell you more about him anyway. Um, you love him as the presenter of the hugely successful and captivating Radio National program Conversations. Woo! Broadcast... <laughs> broadcast all over Australia. It is the most downloaded podcast in the country and it's also enjoyed by millions of listeners around the world. He's also the author of great books of best-selling non-fiction. Um, re most recently, The Golden Maze, which is about the history of Prague. The Ghost Empire, which is about Constantinople's history. And Sagaland, which he co-authored with Kari Gislason, which is about Icelandic sagas. Um, in his previous incarnations, he was also the founding mem a founding member of the Australian provocative comedy trio, the Doug Anthony All-Stars. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, his latest book that we're going to be discussing this evening, though, is called The Book of Roads and Kingdoms. It introduces us to the medieval wanderers, the religious political leaders, the diplomats, the writers, the scientists, the explorers, who travelled to the outer edges of the known world during the Persian and Roman empires and also during Islam's fabled golden age. In this book, Richard helps us get to know the people, their customs, their beliefs, as well as their empire's dramatic rise and devastating fall. The book shines a light on lost worlds and it fills in gaps about cultures you may only have heard about in passing. Please join me in making Richard Feidler welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that lovely welcome, Michaela. It's a great pleasure and honour to be here as the first speaker or guest of this superb, highly esteemed literary salon mm. right here in this excellent bolo. Uh, I think its cultural impact is enormous. That's immediately apparent. And given that Albo is the local member, I think we can honestly expect someone to show up from the Australia Council with a cheque for $50 million. <laughs> here you are. No questions asked. Spend it on the arts. Go for your life, Peter and Bowling Club. And if it doesn't happen, it's a crime. Exactly. I love it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into this book. Uh, as I mentioned before, you've written previously about the medieval history of Prague, about Constantinople, but where did the idea for this book come from? Where were you coming... How did you come to it? Well, this is my COVID book. I was stuck inside during the COVID lockdowns, as we all were, and rather than bake sourdough bread or go for endless <laughs> long walks, I thought I'd, I'd write a different kind of a book. Because I had a plan to write another book entirely, which would require travel, and then travel was impossible. So I thought, well, what about writing about travel and the medieval idea of travel when travel was a much more uh, both romantic and dangerous notion than it is now? Because it honestly uh, meant so many people had no idea what lay beyond the horizon. There were fanciful rumours of all kinds of strange creatures, people dancing about in hula skirts with faces on their chests, that kind of a thing. And so I thought a bit about that. And I, then I, th I thought, let's go back to the Vikings for a bit. Uh, I wrote quite a bit about the Vikings with Kari and Sagaland. But let's look at the ones that went into Eastern Europe. The Vikings not only, of course, conquered parts of Britain, Ireland and France and had a good crack at Spain at some point. <laughs> they also went into Eastern Europe uh, to where uh, modern-day St. Petersburg is at the moment and went through the river systems trading furs and then going down to the Black Sea to Constantinople where some of them served in the emperor of Constantinople's elite Varangian guard. So I, I found this, uh, this extraordinary tract written by a medieval Arab traveller called Ibn Fadlan. Ibn Fadlan gives us the only extant thing, uh, uh, account, first-hand account we have of a Viking human sacrifice. And I read Ibn Fadlan's account and it astonished me. It's really one of the most remarkable documents that's been rediscovered from the uh, early, uh, well, mid medieval period. Ibn Fadlan was this diplomat and an expert in Islamic protocol. Uh, he worked under the Caliph of Baghdad, whose name was Al Muqtadir at the time. And the Caliph had received a letter from a distant king, a Turkic king, living up uh, on the Volga River in modern day Russia near the city of Kazan today. He said, the king said, I wish to become a loyal subject of uh, the Caliph and I want to become a, a proper Muslim. Uh, please send me people who can construct me in the correct ways of Islam and some money so I can build a fort and a mosque. So a huge expedition was sent off that went out of Baghdad and went north. And Ibn Fadlan's account describes in some detail the journey. And to really enjoy it, you have to imagine the kind of guy he was. 
He was travelling out of Baghdad, which was the biggest and richest city in the world at the time, by far. And he was a kind of urbane, charming, brilliant scholar. He was kind of like a cafe latte drinking <laughs> inner city person, <laughs> suddenly thrust out into this wake and fright world, mm. which was on the Ustjert Plateau going past the Caspian Sea. And it was like um, wake and fright on crack. Wake and fright in, on crack, indeed. He heading ever further north, where conditions became bitterly cold, the guy who was supposed to have the wagon of money never showed up, that was a bit troubling. They went further north, and he described, and he bitched and moaned about the cold, it was just a nightmare. He was forced to rely on the hospitality of the local Turkic nomadic tribes, the Osgur Turks, who um, offered him every hospitality, but all he does is bitch and moan about how <laughs> coarse they are, and how disgusting their personal hygiene is, <laughs> and they're not good Muslims. And uh, But I kind of liked his whining, whininess. <laughs> I kind of enjoyed it. Finally, he, they arrive in this city of, of this king, this kingdom, on the Volga River. And it's all going very well for a couple of days. They're welcomed. There's a great ceremony. There's a presentation of a, of a handsome uh, cloak uh, for the king. And then the king asks after a couple of days, well, where's the money? And they go, well, hasn't it arrived yet? No, it hasn't. And the king gets very mad at this point and holds Ibn Fadlan and his party hostage. And this is a great shame to him. He feels the sting of this, because he's such an upright and moral person. And I, what I think he goes through in his account, you can read it, I think he goes through something like a nervous breakdown. He starts to see things. He sees warring jinn in the sky. And what was that? Maybe the aurora borealis, possibly. He's taken by the king to see the bones of a giant. He was told that a giant had walked in from the land of Gog and Magog and uh, they couldn't do anything with him, so they killed him, hanged him from a tree. And sure enough, he sees this kind of pyramid of bones at the foot of a tree. And that could have been anything, like the bones of a bear or a, even a, a thought-out mastodon. Who knows? But he was full of, of awe. And then this party of Vikings arrive on the Volga and they set up camp to trade furs. And the Vikings are not Christian at this point. They're still pagans. And at first, he's overcome by their beauty, their physical beauty. And he says, oh, these people look amazing. They're so tall. They're incredible looking. They have pale blue eyes, blonde or red hair, amazing garments and, and jewellery. Oh, my God, they're so beautiful. Day two, he says, these are the most disgusting people <laughs> I have ever met. Oh, God. Oh. And he talks about the morning ablutions of the senior men amongst the Vikings. And he says, the chieftain is presented by, with, by his slave with a wooden bowl. Um, he ejects the contents of his nose into that, into that <laughs> bowl of water, dips his comb in the, the snotty water, combs his hair with it, has a drink from the bowl of water, and then passes it on to the next man who does the same thing. And it's, it's a bit like British people taking a bath, you know, like the, the, water, the water gets worse and worse. And so he's just, oh, that's just repulsive to him. And then the chieftain of the Vikings dies while they're there. And the senior men come to uh, the chieftain's, the dead chieftain's slaves and says, which of you wishes to be buried alongside your master? And a young woman puts up her hand, according to Ibn Fadlan's account. What happens, I won't go into the details of it because it's, it's really very, very harrowing. But what happens to her the following day, the next few days, she becomes sort of like the bride of the dead chieftain. And she's given all this attention and a lot of alcohol to drink. Um, her hair is braided, she's given anklets and bracelets. But when it comes to the moment for her sacrifice, it's really one of the strangest things I've ever read in my life. Mm. And reading it, I had this sense that whoever had witnessed this deeply distressing and, and wild pagan ceremony of, of her death travelled right out to the furthest edge of human experience. It's a completely unforgettable account. So he saw this. He came back and wrote an account, and it appeared in a, a, one of the many compendious geographies that were written of the time, because the uh, Arabs in Baghdad in the Golden Age of Islam were obsessed with travel, they were obsessed with books, and they were obsessed with books about travel. And they wrote these compendious geographies of the world, and this was a document that had only re recently been recovered, actually, properly recovered in the 1930s and only translated in, into English in the 70s. And I think it's one of the most extraordinary documents of the Middle Ages. And I, after I read that, I went, I don't want to write about Vikings. I want to write about these, these Arab and Persian travellers out of Baghdad. I wonder how many other travellers' accounts. And my God, there's a, there's a treasury of travellers' accounts 
from uh, people from the uh, Abbasid Caliphate who thought that they'd won the whole world. They'd had the biggest empire the world had ever seen up until that point. And they felt that the, they felt the sunshine of God on their faces. They felt they'd won a world. It had been given to them. It was their manifest destiny. Yes, manifest destiny to go out into the world, settle it, bring Islam to those people, and to write about the things they found. So there's this enormous wealth, this treasury of stories translated into English and other languages of the travels of these people who went all over the world, from Russia, as I said, to Germany, to Constantinople, to uh, right down the east coast of Africa, past Zanzibar, to Southeast Asia and to Guangzhou, where they had a special trading colony in, colony, uh, colony in, in modern day China. These accounts are fantastic. They're so entertaining, so informative. Some of them are wildly fictional. Um, they're like travellers, uh, fantasy tales, they're wonder tales. But others really take care to be as rigorous and as honest and uh, as honourable as possible. So this was such a pleasure to write in the end, this book, mm. Michaela, and the perfect book to write, about, uh, to write a book about travel at a time when none of us could travel. Mm. Again, yeah. I want to speak with you about the Abbasid Caliphate, but before we get there, they, before they were in charge, before that, that extraordinary empire rose quite suddenly, the lay of the land really was divided between the Persian Empire and the Romans. Yes, that's right. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about what lands they had and how they felt about each other? In, in the 6th century, the dominant empires in the region were what was, had been known as the Eastern Roman Empire, or the later Roman Empire, or the Christian Roman Empire, an empire that's today called Byzantium, or the Byzantine Empire, but it's certainly not what it was called at the time. Byzantium is a, a name given to it long after its its death by historians to distinguish it from the ancient Roman Empire. Uh, they never called themselves Byzantines, they only ever, ever called themselves Romans. And they ruled from Constantinople, which is now modern day Istanbul, which was known as the Second Rome. Roman for them was a civilizational term. It didn't really need to have anything to do with the city of Rome at all. So there was the Eastern Roman Empire centered around the city of Constantinople, which at that time in the sixth century was again the biggest and most splendid city in the world. And the empire of the Sassanid Persians. And their capital was Ctesiphon in Iraq on the Tigris River. The ruins of it still exist today. And the emperors of that knew each other. They, one emperor of the, uh, the Shah and Shah of the Sassanids wrote a letter to the Roman emperor in Constantinople. He said, we are the two eyes of the world. They were rivals, sometimes collaborators. You'd never quite say they were friends. They understood the, it, what it was like to be a great empire. They were great civilizations with their culture, literature, art, the whole thing. And then, then they went to war for 20 years. And this is, it came after a long period of wave after wave of plague, which hollowed out their populations. They went to war for a 20 year period. The Shah and Shah Khusro II, declared war on Constantinople and did much better than he thought, got almost to, got to the far shore of, of Constantinople, then eventually was pushed back and it left both these empires hollowed out. And that's when they both got the shock of their lives because that's when the Arabs suddenly emerged. Now the Arabs to them at that point were a marginal people, often spoken of by both the, Ara the Romans and the Persians with contempt. Um, Procopius, the historian of Justinian, the great... Uh, emperor in Constantinople, said the Arabs are um, brilliant raiders but they cannot take a city. That was the view of them. They were hard, scrabble people living in the Hijaz of Arabia, the desert there, which had few resources, very little wealth. Um, it was so marginal, neither empire wanted it. They didn't want Arabia. And then, bang, suddenly there's this army coming. There are several armies coming out of Arabia that immediately overrun and take half the Roman Empire, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, parts of Asia Minor, and then they take the whole of the Sassanid Persian Empire, going all the way into Central Asia, building the biggest empire the world had ever seen, up until that point. Bigger than the Roman Empire at its height. So what had changed? What had changed was that the Arab tribes had been unified by a spiritual leader, Muhammad, one of the most consequential figures in the history of the world. 
Uh, what we know of Muhammad is kind of interesting. That's a very big, long conversation mm. about what we know for sure about Muhammad and what we think we know and so on and so forth. But I think what's fascinating in, in the book is you talk about the way that these nomadic desert people suddenly become part... They create the most powerful empire the world has ever seen. And that something about Muhammad and Islam and the Quran unifies them. There's a kind of a worldview. And over, the, over many hundreds of years that you... We're going to have to skip forward in the book because there's so much to cover. But you describe in great detail a kind of a worldview that allowed them both, as you say, this kind of imperial mindset that, you know, that this is God's will, that we become so powerful. But as you describe really beautifully, they're people greatly attracted to... To others, they weren't always, or they weren't necessarily for a long period of time interested in conversion. No. So, no. and they were great lovers of literature and of poetry and of science. How did they? What was the mindset, I suppose, that that Muhammad's existence and the Quran and unifying the, those people kind of gave them that allowed them that extraordinary expansion? Before Muhammad, they they were largely pagans, desert dwelling pagans. One of their many gods in their pantheon of gods was Allah. And Mecca was a uh, holy city for them. The Kaaba, the great cube that we see today, was a, temp was a kind of a temple with little stone gods in it. Then Muhammad arrives. He has visions while sitting outside of a cave. The angel Gabriel or Jibreel comes to him and, and says, recite. And these words come out of his mouth. And these are the words of the Holy Quran. And the vision, the words of the Quran are to Muslims what the body of Christ is to Christians. So in, in the Christian religion, the body of Christ is that thing that comes into the world, into our diurnal mortal world from heaven. Uh, whereas for Muslims, it's the words of the Quran. This is speech directly transmitted to earth th through the voice of Muhammad from the mind of God. So this is, this is a, an absolute key difference. Uh, until this point, like I said, they, they've been uh, desert dwelling uh, uh, pantheists, worships of, worshippers of pagan gods, um, they always had a strong, as you say, uh, poetic tradition. They reminded me all the time of the Vikings, actually, in this sense, the, these kind of great hardy warriors living in, ex in climactic extremes, able to be brilliant raiders, raiders, traders and settlers, if you like, like the Vikings. And like the Vikings, they revered poetry, mm -hmm. because as pre-literate people, uh, they would have uh, special poets who would keep all the ancestral memory of the tribe. They would remember who was married to who, who was then, uh, who was whose grandson. There's this kind of great matrix of ancestors in their heads, the way that a, a lot of indigenous Australian people do today. And with that, they would also remember the folklore of a great chieftain from hundreds of years ago who did this, this and this. And this is how they would be entertained around the fire at night. And being a culture of oral tradition, so much of it is passed on uh, word for word. Now, this is a point of contention. I'm of the view, having read about and written the sagas of Iceland, which were passed down by old tradition, there are certain mechanisms that pre-literate societies have for passing on stories uh, word for word uh, from person to person through generation to generation. So suddenly Muhammad appears, has this galvanising vision, which owes a lot to the old Abrahamic faiths like Judaism and Christianity, and galvanises his people, unifies them, and teaches them to rise above mere tribal loyalty. So suddenly, we are Muslims now, and this is a universal religion, and it's the final revelation from God, and this, with this, religion is perf perfected. And with this, he unites the tribes of Arabia. And after his death, there's the first of the, the, the caliphs, which a word, it's a tricky word, it means both deputy and successor, kind of, sort of, in Arabic. The first of them, Abu Bakr, decides to keep the people, his people unified. He will lead his armies on raiding missions on the Arab and Persian outposts to the north of where the borders of the Arabian and, uh, sorry, of the Roman and Persian empires. Uh, it's near where Iraq is today, Syria, Iraq, that part of the world. But like I say, these empires have fought themselves to a standstill. They're hollowed out empires and the Arabs are shocked because what starts out as raiding missions, very quickly become missions of conquest mm -hmm. that are successful beyond anyone's wildest expectations. The Romans are kicked out of Egypt. The Romans have been in Egypt for some 600 years up at this, this point, six, 700 years. The Romans have been there since the time of Augustus, Mark Antony and Cleopatra. This is the breadbasket of the Roman Empire or the great grain uh, growing districts of the Nile, mm -hmm. gone. 
gone from the Romans for good. And like I say, then they run over the whole of the uh, Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. They become a literate society and very quickly become the most bookish society the world has ever seen. Um, we, we spend a lot of time with all of these caliphs over many sort of centuries throughout the book and we hear about their, some of their attributes, their, the powerful kind of parallel courts they have when their wives have power, their sons and the infighting, there's a lot of infighting. Yeah. Um, but I wondered if you could help us understand what the Abbasid Caliphate achieved at its height. What is so astonishing about it when we look back at it with the kind of that perspective that you give us in the book? It saved the knowledge of antiquity. Just as some, to a lesser degree, I think now, something I only realise now, the Eastern Roman Empire did. They really did save the knowledge of antiquity. As soon as they, several things happened all at once. The first uh, Arab dynasty, well, there was the, the, fight, the rightly guided caliphs, then there was the Umayyad dynasty based in Damascus, in modern day Syria. They were overthrown uh, by a revolution in the 700s by uh, another, the descendants of another of the Prophet's relatives, a, di a, a dynasty called the Abbasids. And they built a purpose-built capital, a purpose-built capital on the Tigris River, which was Baghdad. And this was built as a utopian city. It was known as the City of Peace. It was built by the second of the Abbasid Caliphs, al Mansur, who designed it with a disc at the centre. It's like Canberra, essentially. Purpose-built <laughs> capital with a, with a circle right at the centre of it, which is where the, the central palace and the mosque w were. And then various districts, markets were put around it. And gates, four gates were built on the cardinal points of the, com the compass, which is where the cover design comes from. Uh, gates leading to the four parts of the world. And once the gates were completed, Mansur stood atop one of the gates and looked out at the Tigris River and said, here is the Tigris and nothing stands between it and China. So at this point, the Arabs had decided to, they'd lost interest in the Mediterranean world. The Mediterranean world was really small potatoes. What was more interesting to them at that point was China and Persia and India and, to a lesser degree, Africa. And, yeah, sure, those people in Europe, sure. Constantinople unnerved them a bit because that was the only city really to rival them, that and Xi'an in, in China. Um, but, but nonetheless, they, were, they just went, well, we'll just shift our business to the east, to the centre of the world, and Baghdad became the fulcrum of the world. Pretty soon after the discovery of Baghdad, several things happened all at once. One was that the caliph built a royal library called the Bayt al-Hikmah, which means uh, the House of Wisdom. And this was a great repository of knowledge, like a library in a university all at once, that dedicated itself to gathering the wisdom of the ancient Greeks and ancient India and translating it into Arabic. The second thing that happened was they developed a new kind of Arabic cursive script, which meant you could copy books much more quickly. The third thing that happened is they adopted Indian numbers we call them Arabic numbers, that's because they were introduced to Europe from the Arabic world, but th they really got the numeral system that we use today, one, two, three, four, five, from the Indian world, which made computation, accounting, mathematics, algebra, which is an Arabic word, algorithm is an Arabic word, much, much easier as anyone dealing with the old Roman numerals and trying to divide MCXV11 <laughs> into equal portions of LXV11 will, will immediately understand. <laughs> And so with this, this, this new neural system, there's a flourishing of mathematics, of astronomy, of uh, algebra, like I said. All these things suddenly come at once. And the final piece of the puzzle, though, was the slow influx of Chinese paper-making technology. Until then, knowledge had been recorded on papyrus leaves, which were easily erasable, so you could forge documents, or on parchment skins, which were very expensive because they were made from animal hide. But paper, paper's so cheap to make. It absorbs the ink, so you can't forge documents as easily. It's a pleasure to write on with a brush, as anyone who's written on it, you know, done any calligraphic work will, will know. And it has this tensile strength. And look, it can hold all this information. And they quickly found, of course, that once you stacked uh, equally sized sheets of paper into a sheaf like this and bound it on one side, you could create a codex or a book, which is so much more efficient way to contain information than a scroll, and you can locate information in it much more quickly. So bang, very quickly after the founding of Baghdad, it becomes this book haven. Whole districts of the city are given over to bookmakers and booksellers. Baghdad, because it was sitting in the Tigris, in the Sawad, the rich Sawad, uh, black soil, agricultural lands, uh, it was placed there deliberately so it could, could um, sustain a large population. It became the biggest city in the world. 
first medieval city to pass the million person population threshold mark. And it became this famous place where if you really wanted to find out how things in the world work, you had to come to Baghdad. Mm. Extraordinary. We meet these wonderful characters throughout the book. You, you spoke before about um, Ibn Fadlan, Fadlan mm -hmm. and his travels. Another person who really jumped out at me is Masudi, who was a wonderful Arab scholar and traveller, but also Ibn Khaldun. And I wondered if you could talk about him and his writing a bit as well, some of which you might, when, when Richard starts to speak about it and you think, is that the storyline to the film Dune that we saw last year? It was because it's Ibn Khaldun's um, writing. Can you tell us a bit about him? Well, I, I, I might, can I start with Masudi to Please. begin with? Yeah. yeah. Masudi is the guy I like the most. I love reading about Masudi. Masudi was from the, a writer from the late 10th, early, uh, no, late 8th, no, late 9th, early 10th century, who in his time was the best travelled man in the world. He'd been right across what was then the known world. He'd been to Africa, down past Zanzibar. He'd been to, uh, to Europe, he'd been to Constantinople, he'd been to China, and he'd been to India, and had written extensively of these places. And he wrote this wonderful book uh, with a beautiful title called Meadows of Gold and Mines of Gems. Isn't that a lovely title? Mm -hmm. And so many books of this era written by these authors are like that. They have this, this sense they're relishing the world. And, and why wouldn't they think that way? They felt they'd arrived. They were like the 20th century Americans and the 19th century British. They felt that they'd finally got it right. They, they'd arrived at the best ideology, the best religion, the best way of looking at the world. They knew themselves to be the richest, most civilised, most advanced society in the world. And this was because God had just rolled out the red carpet for them and the world was their oyster, literally. So they had this enormous cultural confidence and when you read stories of some of those, the, the travellers, uh, like when I wrote my Prague book, the first person ever to write a description of the city of Prague was a traveller from the Emirate of Cordoba, known as Ibn Yaqub, who sort of goes to very early pagan Prague in the 800s and writes like a kind of a British anthropologist on tour. <laughs> and, he said, and he's a bit like one of those, well, this is a city called Prague, it's made out of limestone and, and, st and this is marvellous, and what are you doing over there? You there, what are you doing there? Oh, that looks like a sauna. Marvellous. And what's your, is that your stone god over there? Good for you. How interesting. <laughs> and if you bang that drum, that makes an interesting noise for you, does it? Keep on, carry it. It's like a British imperialist with a pith helmet on, uh, walking through the whole thing. That was the tone they had. They're generous, interested, you know, that kind of thing. Marvellous. Not for us, of course, and you're horribly backwards, but marvellous. <laughs> Fascinating. That's what you believe in, is it? Good for you. Oh, well, off to Dresden, you know. Um, so that's, that's how they wrote about the world. And Masudi's a little bit like that. Uh, but he writes with this great sense of relishing the world, this enjoyment of the world. And one of the most fun things I encountered amongst his writings, I found it in a letter that had been translated. And can I do this reading? Now? Yes, yeah. please. Um, I found Masudi in a letter had given a potion for invisibility. And uh, I'll just do a reading from the front part of my book where I've, I've sort of paraphrased it a little bit. Um, this is how I've, I've actually begun my book. This is how you become invisible. Anyone can do this. First, you must find a dead cat. The animal must have already died from old age or from some misadventure. You must not slaughter one for this purpose. Carefully remove the dead cat's head, then hollow out its eyes. Then take it to a patch of ground in a place where no one's likely to visit. Dig a hole. The hole should be as deep as the distance from your elbow to your fingertips. Put some dung at the bottom, place the cat's head inside the pit so it faces up towards the sky. Now you must do this. In both the eye sockets, place a castor oil seed. Then fill the rest of the hole with dung and pat it down. Sprinkle a handful of fine dirt around the edges in a circle, then place a round stone on top. No one must see you do this. Then every day for the next 30 days, you must irrigate the site with blood. Now, this should be procured from a blood letter. Again, no creature should be harmed. If after 40 days there's a shoot from the soil, good. If not, continue watering it with blood for 60 days. If it sprouts, good. If not, then continue watering it in this manner for 70 days. If not, then for 90 days. Tell no one of this. After a time, one or two plants may grow. When they begin to bear fruit, and this is crucial, you must not let the fruit fall from the tree to the ground. Instead, carefully harvest some seeds from the pods. This should be done while the moon is waxing and not waning. <laughs> then you must climb up to a high place, like a rooftop, and sit there with the seeds in your lap. To your left, 
there must be a 14-year-old boy on the cusp of puberty. <laughs> to your right, there must be another 14-year-old boy who is also not yet a man. Put one of the seeds in your mouth, then turn to the boy on your left and ask, do you see me? <laughs> if the boy says yes, then turn to the boy on your right, taking care not to lose your balance, and ask, do you see me? If he also says yes, well, then throw the seed away and place another in your mouth. Now repeat this process with each of the other seeds until you find the one seed that when placed in your mouth will make both boys answer, no. <laughs> Then carefully place this special seed inside a signet ring concealed under a jewel and wear it on, on your finger. Then, whenever you wish to avoid someone in the marketplace, put your ring in your mouth and then disappear. Many people have done this and succeeded. That's Masudi. <laughs> now, now, there are a couple of things I really like about that letter. First of all, um, I like the idea is you have this incredible ring that makes you invisible. It's like the, the ring of power from Lord of the Rings. And, and you don't use it to defeat Sauron. You use it to avoid Barry in the marketplace who you can't stand. Oh, shit, there's Barry. You know? There we go. OK, let's get out of here. The second thing I like about this, I think this is a prank. I think this is Masudi writing a prank here. And I think the key is that he says, get a cat, but it, it's already got to be dead. Uh, it, like, he doesn't want any animals harmed in the making of this. I think he just wants to encourage some gormless fool to climb up to a rooftop with a couple of kids and say, do you see me? <laughs> oh, no. So I love Masudi. He's so chatty. He's gossipy about court politics of the day. He's insightful. He loves poetry. He's funny. He's bawdy. I loved him. And he's, he's a, he, he speaks of the confidence of, of that age. Mm. Now, this brings us to Ibn Khaldun, who's another figure. But this is... And they're good sort of bookends, aren't they're, they? They're good bookends. They really are. Mm. Ibn Khaldun's writing after the fall of Baghdad, after Baghdad was utterly destroyed uh, in the 13th century. And his tone is much more pessimistic. He's writing this great philosophical tract in what is now modern-day Tunisia, in a kind of a ruined castle. And at the beginning of his great work, it's known as the Mukadima, the, the prologue, he has this theory on the rise and falls of civilizations. He said, civilizations rise and fall on the basis of what he calls, it's an Arabic word, it's called asabiya. It's a word that means group feeling. This is Muhammad's great gift, to unite the, the warring Arab tribes, to give them, in part, this asabiya, the sense of group feeling, which makes them enormously powerful for a time. They overrun the other weakened empires of the Romans, the Persians. They build their own empire. They build a great city. And then you have this, you've won this empire through these hard-handed warriors that come out of nowhere, united by this hard sense of purpose. You build a great city, of course, and you can sustain the asabiya for a while, he says, with hierarchy. The hierarchy flows down from the caliph, who's also known as the commander of the faithful. But after a while, it weakens. Inevitably, the caliph, uh, the people of the caliphate or the empire become prosperous. They no longer want to serve in the army. So the emperor or the caliph has to then hire uh, mercenaries. And in the caliph's case, they use Turkish mercenaries. Then the caliph inevitably becomes a prisoner of these mercenaries. This is exactly what happened in the ancient Roman Empire, by the way. I'm not quite sure if, if, how aware Ibn Khaldun was, was of this. And this leads to decline and fall as the next group of total hard asses come out of a hard country <laughs> like the Mongols and overrun your empire. They were serious hard asses. They were serious, very unpleasant human beings, they were, um, indeed. Uh, and so, so this is his great pessimistic theory of history. And he was rediscovered in the 20th century by Western thinkers like Spengler and uh, Toynbee, and th who in turn read the, the knowledge of the Makadima was, uh, was passed on to uh, Frank Herbert, who used it, to gave him the idea to write Dune, and of course Isaac Asimov's mm. foundation series owes so much to Ibn Khaldun, and both authors acknowledge that. And you see Dune, those people in the desert, the freemen, you know, mm. this is all from the writings of Ibn Khaldun and his deep pessimism, and a great sense of futility, the ultimate futility of human endeavour. It's all designed in the end to crumble into dust and fall to pieces. It's beautifully written, Makadima. Uh, it's a fascinating work, of a great work of philosophy.
Mm. Most of the cultures that you describe in this book are highly patriarchal, that's what they were, but we do meet some extraordinary, very powerful women in a couple of, of the epochs. One of them is the Empress Irene, and the other is, who, who stayed out, stuck out to me was um, Shakab. Can you tell us a bit about how women sort of survived in those empires, or didn't? I always try and pay close attention to the women who get mentioned in medieval history. This isn't out of some kind of tedious ideological duty. It's just that any woman who's achieved political success in such deeply patriarchal societies, who've risen to the top despite everything working against them, you have to look at them closely. And you often tend to find that such women are political geniuses. I think this is true of Elizabeth I. I think this is true of a great forgotten empress, Irene of Athens, who was the only emperor, empress in Constantinople who ever took the title of emperor for herself, who outfoxed everyone and brought her empire into a new golden age. She really, I think you can argue, uh, gets the ball rolling on the revival of Byzantium as a civilizational project, ended the iconoclastic wars, did so much, outfoxed her her male chauvinist generals, uh, the rivals of her dead husband, which I'm pretty sure she murdered. I'm pretty sure she murdered her husband. Um, well, fair uh, enough. Uh, I mean, well, well uh, husband's, husband's actually quite a nice guy, but just not a very good emperor. She just went, nah, <laughs> that was that. She said he ended up dying from an infection that he got from wearing the crown. That was, it. like, the emperor just disappeared, and she came out saying, oh, terrible news, the emperor's dead. Uh, he got a nasty infection, and he said the crown was too tight. Anyway, I'm running things from now on as regent. Uh, until my son comes of age, and uh, has anyone got a problem with that? No, no, I have no problem. <laughs> and, and she was so skillful. She outfoxed her dead husband's brothers by forcing them into the church, made them monks, and then had them accept holy orders from her in the Hagia Sophia, and they had to kneel in front of her. She, was, she outfoxed her generals. She put them in different commands, which didn't matter anywhere, and found brilliant eunuch generals who were prepared to, who had no problem serving under a woman. Uh, unfortunately, though, she didn't bother to teach her son anything. And when her son came of age, he let himself be manipulated into a palace coup that overthrew Irene. She was kept in, a, kept in the palace, sequestered in the palace. The, the son was hopeless, couldn't run a thing. And she led another coup d'etat against her son, had him brought before her and had his eyes gouged out and he bled to death. Yeah, let's like, see, a minute ago, you were all, yeah, you go, girl, <laughs> weren't you, hey? She gouged her son's eyes out. Well, she didn't do it herself. She got some dude to do it, of course. <laughs> and he died. But men did the same things. This is the Middle Ages we're talking about. Uh, she, was, she was a genius. In the end, she was overthrown. But when she was talking about getting married to Charlemagne, of all people, she's a fascinating figure. I wrote about her more extensively in Ghost Empire, my, Empire, my first book, but she appears in this as well. Uh, and then there's Shaghab, who appears later on. The caliph I mentioned earlier, Muqtadir, Muktadir, the one who sent Ibn Fadlan up, to, up into Russia. Muktadir, oh dear, he wasn't a very good caliph at all. He was a very, very nice man, uh, a bit on the decadent side, very, very sweet, utterly manipulated by his courtiers, and his mother, Shaghab, had to step in and run the empire. It was hard to write about powerful woman, women in the Abbasid Empire. Of all the, the... All these societies are very patriarchal, of course, but this one particularly so, because... Women were sequestered. Noble women and other women were sequestered in a harem, which, had, which was like a parallel city of women with its own court structure. And they were often lorded over by the queen mother, of whom Shag, this was Shaghab. Mm. Uh, they were often nearly always the most powerful figures. You don't really... All their voices are mediated by male historians. So they're hard to write about. Shaghab was an impressive figure. She was super rich. Um, she gave over her whole... Uh, fortune, her vast fortune, she was more wealthy than her son, the Caliph, but it did them no good in the end. She, both she and, uh, and, um, uh, and her, her son were murdered in uh, one of those lovely bits of court politics that take place. But then there's Zubaydah, who was the wife of the great Harun al-Rashid. Uh, Harun al-Rashid, who appears in the Thousand and One Nights or Thousand and One uh, Arabian Nights. And people here read that uh, when they were kids or when they were adults. One of the great masterpieces, treasuries of world literature. Harun al-Rashid appears that, as does Zubaydah, here and there, as I recall. Mm. She's a fascinating figure as well. She paid, used her huge fortune to pay for a pilgrim's route to Mecca um, to have these wells and pools built for poor pilgrims. And the road to Mecca 
uh, for those pilgrims today is still called Zubaydah's Way. Mm. But again, it was hard, very hard. To hear the women is a bit like hearing muffled voices in another room. The only women I could find who I think were, could be quoted verbatim were the slave singers. This was a whole cast of women in the Abbasid Empire who were gifted musicians. They were both slaves and kind of like rock stars at the same time. But I don't want to overstate or understate their power. It, there's a lot of contradictions here. They were talented girls who were, girl slaves were spotted, they had musical talent as a, a, in their youth, were sent to Medina, to a conservatorium, to be educated in music, taught how to play the oud, the Arabic lute, to uh, learn music history, theory, and practice. Uh, they would learn the absolute complexities uh, and harmonics of the, the complex Arabic music at the time. And they were taught how to coin poetic phrases just off the top of their heads, you know, like Lou Reed, but kind of better in a way. <laughs> you know, that ability to coin poetic rhyming phrases. Uh, and once they came of age, they were owned by men, wealthy and powerful men, often by caliphs as well, and brought in to entertain men, like geishas, kind of a geisha in a way. Uh, the men, of course, having sequestered all their, their most interesting women in the harem, suddenly found, of course, the life was kind of boring without female company, which is why they wanted these incredibly talented women. And the reason why we can hear their voices is some of them wrote such cuttingly sarcastic, funny phrases, uh, lines of poetry, that they remembered and quoted verbatim. So that's when I start to hear their voices. And the more cutting and sarcastic they were with these men, the better it went over. Because, you know, she, one man would try and flirt with her and she'd deliver this cutting, devastating line about how ugly and fat he was. And the other guys would go, eh, <laughs> she's got you there, mate, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> that would be going on. But they also, the men at the time also wrote, oh my God, I'm in love with this woman. I, she's just driving me crazy. I, I, they, they, they wrote, they completely lost their head. They felt like about these women the way I used to feel about Kate Bush when I was 17. And to be honest, still feel about <laughs> that way. Uh, or Elizabeth Fraser from the Cocteau Twins, I still feel that way. Oh my God, you're incredible, you're amazing. I, I, I want to start a church to worship your divine head. So, so men would be like that. But then they'd also write, oh, she's so heartless. She toys with my heart. She's cruel, a terrible terrible human being, you know, on and on it goes. This is, these are things women are familiar with, I know, hearing men write about them in this way. But it's in these lines of poetry that these fabulous slave singers, the voices suddenly appear out of nowhere. And Harun al-Rashid fell deeply in love with one in particular, uh, who I've written about also in the book. Yeah. You mentioned before um, the Thousand and One Nights, and throughout uh, all the different um, kind of caliphs and times that you write about, we discover all these different poets and works of literature. And there are too many to talk about, and it's, they're so beautiful to read. But can you tell us about maybe one that really pierced your heart, that really oh, stayed yeah. with you? Um, oh, there's quite a few of them, really. Off, off the top of my head, the thing that I, one of the things I really love is finding a poet whose name eludes me at the moment. Basra, the city of Basra in, in Iraq today, back then was like a major intellectual centre. It was a big trading port. But it was a bit like, um, I don't want to call it Oxford or anything like that, but, but it was a major literary centre. If you wanted to start out as a poet, uh, then you really had to go to Basra before you went to Baghdad. And I should at this point also point out that in the Abbasid Empire, the two most highly paid professions were poet and translator, not hedge fund manager. <laughs> And there was one poet, his name eludes me at the moment, he had this famous line. The poets became very articulate, very erudite, very learned people. Um, they, would, they would often come down to the marketplace in Basra as the Bedouin herdsmen were coming in first thing in the morning at dawn to trade and to buy and sell animals and other uh, objects in the marketplace. And they'd sit them down and, and pick their brains for the huge storehouse of wealth of knowledge that these herdsmen had, these vast memory palaces that these herdsmen and poets, uh, Bedouin poets, had in their heads, which, which being pre-literate or illiterate people, they contained these whole worlds inside their memories. They, they create these very complex memory palaces. And so these poets would meet them and draw stories, draw the poetry out, the complex lines of poetry, out of these herdsmen. And so although the poets and scholars of the Abbasid Empire became very learned, cosmopolitan, erudite, uh, sophisticated people, they still revered the poetic stark beauty of the desert and revered the old 
old preliterate Bedouin culture. So this poet I'm thinking of, even though he was a very cultured man, he could still write, I am still of night and horses and the desert. Isn't that a great line? Night and horses and the desert. So th there are so many wonderful lines in poetry that really stick in my mind. There's another line I just I can remember. I'll, I'll try and come back to it if I find it in the mm. book um, by the great, one of the great mathematicians of the age too, because even mathematicians were great poets in these times. <laughs> There was a section in the book where a whole lot of poets are brought together in a square and asked to write a poem on their, you know, straight off the top of their head. What is love? What is love? One of the great lines I love from that was, love is a magic emission. Mm. Such a great line, you know. What is love? How does it enter the heart through the eye or through the ear uh, or through the breeze, through the ether? What is the nature of love? What does it do to you? How does it torment it? All of them had different, all these, and they are all men. Uh, <laughs> have different things to say about the nature of love, how it affects us. The doctor amongst them talks about how it affects the physiognomy. How does it affect the four humours that keep the body in regulation? Because they're all into Ptolemy and Galen and all the, the, uh, the, the, the wisdom of the ancient Greeks about uh, how the body is made. It's just lovely readings, that this, this, these salons that these great poets and, and scientists and mathematicians would have. Mm. In a moment, we're going to turn up the house lights and have time for your questions. So I hope you've been keeping them in mind as we're going along. But I wanted to ask one last question, which is sort of a writing question. You know, in your other work, as we referred to, as mm -hmm. the host of Conversations, you delve and you investigate and you listen and you research. And I wondered, how does that work shape the way you write? I try to be a hospitable writer. I think in radio, as you know, we have to be... We don't have to be, but we should be companionable. I have learnt, I think, from radio, from doing my program. I remember when I started doing... Oh, I've always loved history, always loved history. I thought, oh, the listeners like history? I don't know, let's try it out. It might be a bit indulgent, but I'll bring in a story on and talk to the story on about the thing that they've written about for an hour. And I found it would go over pretty well. And I then sort of realised, I think, if you go about it the right way, I think in radio, as a presenter, if you go about it the right way, you can infect listeners with your, cur your own curiosity. <laughs> I think there's a contagion that works there, and radio is the most beautiful medium for it. Really, it's the only one in many ways. Well, the, the page. The page and the voice, I think. I don't think it's the same thing with, with TV. I worked in TV for years and years and years, and I'm so glad I work in radio instead now. <laughs> it's so much more interesting a medium to work in. It's a beautiful medium to work in. And so I, I think there's a kind of uh, enchantment that comes with a, a certain kind of storytelling. I love hearing people tell me stories. I've always been like that. My father was a really great raconteur, wonderful raconteur. And I still really like those old values of an, an older Australia where, like the Bedouins and like the Vikings, if you like, an older Australia from the... From, both my parents were working-class country people where you'd entertain each other at night by telling stories. And there was not only a culture of storytelling, but a culture of listening as well. Where you'd take turns, someone would tell a very long story um, that would be funny or deeply sad. Uh, and then everyone would listen, offer comments, and then someone else would tell a story. I, I love that old culture. I think something was lost. And radio has been trying to... Uh, the new forms of public radio that have emerged in the last 10, 15, 20 years have been able to somewhat recapture that sense of listening to that long form uh, kind of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I've brought that same approach to writing, writing about history. Mm -hmm. I approach history, I, I, I prefer to tackle subjects that I don't know anything about to begin with, or know, don't know much about. There's a matrix of history in my head and what, what's happening where at the certain time. And there's these huge blank spots and there will be blank spots in that when I die. But filling in those blank spots is so much fun. It's so enjoyable. You go, oh, and that pertains to this, and that reminds me of that. And I try to bring that same, I try to, again, infect readers with my own curiosity about the subject. And you succeed over and over again. Thank you. Um, can we, Hayley, can we pop the house lights up a bit? Because I can't see anybody. Um, but we have time now. We did start a little bit late, so we'd, oh, I'm glad everyone's staying with us. But we've got at least a good 10 minutes for your questions. There you all are. Um, if you've got a question, I'm going to pop your hand up. There's a question just at the back, Hayley. God, this feels like the end of the disco, doesn't it? Right <laughs> yeah, I know. This really does. But yeah. they're not ugly lights. You're all yeah. beautiful. Yeah. They're yeah. not. Yeah. There's a, a microphone coming to you just now. So Hello. Thanks very much. Hello. Hello, Richard. Thank you. Thank you so much for the last however long it's been. It's been totally enjoyable. The last I really three hours enjoyed it. I've been talking, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you also for what you do on radio. Thank much you. appreciated. I appreciated the fact that at the beginning you said, though, that you wrote this while you were in COVID 
effectively in lockdown. And yet the research that you're expressing to us seems monumental. How did you do it? Was it all the internet or yeah. did you have yeah. other sources? It, was, it absolutely was. I burrowed into some very, very remote corners of the internet. Um, I belong to several library subscription services. Um, I, uh, and through some of those, I, for instance, I found Al Tabari, who's the great medieval Arabic historian, or he might be Persian, I think, but he's a Basid era historian writing in that. He's 34 volumes of a history of the Muslim world are all in translation. They're all uh, down, downloadable in PDF form from some of the library services that I subscribe to. I have all 34 volumes of it. And, and man, that's good gear. Like, it's really good gear. Uh, like, he's a bit dour, but, but by the standards of, of historical writing, of, in many, it's, it's really unparalleled. I can't really find anything to compare it to. Uh, the medieval uh, the Arabs had a way of footnoting that's really quite sophisticated. And the way they do it, instead of like putting a number and read the bottom of the page, the source, they, they, they begin with the source. They go, someone said to someone, said to someone, reported to someone who wrote this, to someone, to someone, to someone, who told it to me, to uh, Al-Tabari, and Al-Tabari, and the, then the, the line begins, Al-Tabari said. Mm. And that's him writing of himself. And on he goes. So, he, so you can check the sources. So there's no other medieval history I've read, whether it's the Chinese court annals or anything that the bibs and bobs that popped out of um, Constantinople over the, uh, the centuries that comes close to that kind of quality of a rigour, historical rigour, that's, that's often so very colourful. And this, this was like expected across the board. Uh, my third chapter, it's divided north, south, east and west. Travellers who went north, south, east and west. The south chapter was about the uh, sailors who went on the great... Indian Ocean trade routes, which was the great trade routes of the, the mar great, ma greatest maritime trade route of the day. Arab sailors went out of uh, Basra or Siraf through the Persian Gulf into the Indian Ocean, catching monsoonal winds along the coast of India, uh, down to Southeast Asia, looping through there, and coming up to Guangzhou, where a whole, there was a whole part of the city of uh, uh, Guangzhou devoted to these travellers. To, where Muslims could have their own judges in the city of Guangzhou. That all went to hell in the 9th century when there was a, one of those great cataclysmic rebellions in China and the whole city was burnt to the ground, so on and so forth. But they also went down the coast of Africa, like I said, to get gold, which was brought over land from Zimbabwe. And these great Muslim African Swahili Muslim kingdoms are built along the East African coast as well, like Kilwa. And... From there I found like, the story of how these coins, again found all this on the internet, how these coins fetched up on a beach in the 1940s. In 1942, three thereabouts, there was an Australian airman named Maury Eisenberg who was posted to this island, Marchenbar Island, off the coast of Arnhem Land, where the Australian Air Force was keeping a radar station to look for incoming Japanese aircraft. And he was sitting on the beach one day, because I think he had the place all to himself, and he found some coins in the sand, thought they look interesting, put them in a matchbox, brought them home, forgot all about them until the 1970s, brought them into uh, the Sydney Coin Museum, and the coin expert, the numismatic, I think that's what you call them, expert went, well, three of these are Dutch East India Company coins. Not surprising. But another couple of these coins, they're from Kilwa. Kilwa was a Swahili... Islamic kingdom that met its heyday in the 800s. How did coins from there fetch up on a beach in Australia? These are the oldest foreign objects ever found in Australia, these coins, and I think the Powerhouse Museum owns them now. So one can only speculate. Wrecks of Arabic dhows, Arabic sailing trading ships have been found uh, in Indonesia off the coast of Java uh, with these vast cargo of Chinese porcelain. Um, there are stories of these China, the Arabic travellers who went up into China, one of whom met the emperor. And I just found all this either through books I was able to get as Kindles uh, or, or as PDFs or from these, from these um, academic sources online. It was the, this huge trove of material just saying, find me. And part, of, part of finding out this information for me is there's a certain way you go about it, and this is going to sound quite mad. So I'm just going to just put that out there to begin with. I have found that when I charge hard at a topic, it skitters away from me. 
when you want to research a subject, you've got to treat it like a shy pet. Um, the, the source material, if you sort of sidle up next to it, it'll sort of come out like a tame, I don't know, kangaroo or something and, and, and eat out of your hand eventually. But you've got to be really careful. Don't, don't frighten it. Don't charge at it. Don't overwhelm it. It's, this, it's a weird process. Um, I know that sounds like magical thinking, and it is, but other writers I've spoken to, my friend Paul Ham, uh, one of my best friends, Paul Ham, is a wonderful historian. He says, yeah, that's exactly what it's like. He, he, it's, that's exactly what it's like. It's a strange process. When I was writing Ghost Empire, I thought, well, okay, where are the women? So in my mind, I called a town hall meeting. I said, women of Byzantium. I said this in my mind. Uh, Friday, I want you to all show up, bring a bottle of scotch, and tell me what what your story is. And so, and then, then the women started to appear. I don't know, I was just ready to see them or something. Theodora, Irene of Athens, these extraordinary women come forward all of a sudden. Mm. So the research is so pleasurable, and when you, it, it's painstaking and boring in large parts, but man, when you find some, some beautiful bit of gold, like Masudi's letter, in which he gives the potion for invisibility, you sort of want to dance a jig, it's so good, it's so exciting. <laughs> And when you pick up the books, which you can buy at the back of the room, um, from our wonderful booksellers, Berkeley Books, um, you can see the extensive EndNotes bibliography, which Richard has painstakingly and really generously put together. Oh, I yeah, found yeah. myself reading them as well as reading the text. Yeah, yeah, there's pages and pages of EndNotes at the end and, and a very extensive bibliography, yeah. Um, yeah. Some more questions. Up the back, Haley. thanks so much. We'll just, wait. we'll just wait for the microphone to come to you. It's coming. I know. Hello. Hello. We trust you. Here we go. Okay, so number one, like many people, thank you, thank you for the conversation hour. Thank you. Um, it's taken me through very difficult times. Uh, you were there and always, and I do appreciate it. Thank you. Number two, why the hell weren't you my history teacher? Yeah. Like, where does this all come from? And number three, Byzantine. Never heard of it, never taught that at school, and it's so fascinating. Mm. And uh, just thank you for all you've done. Thank you. Um, I, I, history, yeah. I, I, when I was taught history at school, and look, I'm not, I'm not going to make a complaint about this. It's really natural for history to be, for people to be chauvinistic about history. It, it's just that's the way it is. Yes, we can complain about the the Western Western centric history we people of my age and perhaps your age were taught, were given as kids. Um, but I think it needs to be recognised as chauvinism. As um, I, I think I was given the impression all the time as a kid that. Um, Civilisation was always going west, like it was born at the intersection of the Tigris and Euphrates, uh, those early Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian empires, then it goes west, it goes from there to ancient Egypt, it goes to ancient Greece, ancient Rome, then there's European Renaissance, then it leaps over the Atlantic, goes to America, the United States, and then it ends up in California where it dies. Like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we're all told, that's the thing. Well, the and, dying in California part is correct. Yeah, absolutely, you do. Uh, and I think the, one of the kind of fallacies of that, and like I said, I don't want to be too hard on this, but is the, the, uh, the period that's known as the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages, yes, yes, the period I've written about was a Dark Age in Western Europe. Yes, this is a time when London and Paris are these muddy outposts. The Romans are long gone. They've forgotten how to repair the aqueduct. The legions, I mean, they've just, it feels like they're, and, and in fact, the medieval writers of the time, when they get to the year 1000, they, they really believe that history is winding down and coming to an end. They have this, they don't have this view that we're on this, this Whiggish view of the world that we're onwards and upwards all the time and technology is making more things think possible. They go, oh, no, no, the world reached a peak in the classical era and it's been winding down ever since and say, Christ will come again in glory and in wrath now and that'll wrap up the world and that'll be it. That was on, a lot of people thought that, monks believed that in the year 1000. So this is a dark age in Western Europe, yes. But in uh, Arabia, in, in Baghdad, in Constantinople, in India, in Persia, uh, and in China, this is an era of trade and science and mathematics and money and hatred and war and love and constant interaction. This is a period when if you're living through it, perhaps you're feeling the pulse quicken. You're getting the sense that the world's getting better and faster and richer and more exciting. Hence the excited tone I found in a lot of writers like Al-Masudi, like 
they know of no dark age in this time at all. This is a time which is an exciting time to be alive. They know that they're living in the best of all places, in the best of all possible times. So it's kind of nice to have one's consciousness shifted about from Western Europe in this period to Baghdad, which is the real centre of the world. This is the hub of the world where all the roads came to it and went out from it again. So, yeah, this was a big thing I, I think I've, I've... a big shift in my mind that had to happen after uh, having been taught history in, in, in school. Having said that, I also... I think that a lot about science. I'm fascinated with physics. I had really very boring physics teachers. I, I really think if you want to teach kids physics, the first opening lesson teaching high school students physics ought to be beginning the whole story of the birth of the universe to the present day. Start with the Big Bang, uh, the, the kind of slow consolidation of gas clouds into matter, the formation of the planet, solar system, the planets, uh, the arrival of life on Earth, uh, civilization, complex life forms, and here we are today. What a cool way that would be to get an introduction into physics and biology, I think. But no, it's like... Here's the, here's the table of elements and, uh, you know, oh, God, God. So I got really bored and so I've been tr trying to play catch-up ever since and failing. It's just I've left it too late. But I still really love talking about physics and cosmology on my radio program and just approach it like a curious 10-year-old because that's the level I'm at. That's what's, what's so extraordinary about the book is it, and I felt that all the way through, it gives us this other lens, not just of the Arab world or of the Muslim kind of faith, but of the intersection of all those cultures that we just don't read about, we didn't hear about. I said the same to Richard before tonight. I should say that Richard is going to be signing books up the back as well. So if you feel like you need to have a longer chat with him, you will get your chance. But I think we've got time for one more question. We've got 74 questions. Down the, down the back and then we'll come to you up the front. Hello. Hi, Richard. I mean, I can't wait to buy that book. It was fantastic. Thank you. Um, just talking about conversations, um, you know, sometimes you just start out with the most quotidian of characters. Mary, who owns a dairy in Toowoomba. How do you find these people? Um, I work with brilliant producers. I really do work with brilliant, brilliant producers who are extraordinary people. And I take their advice. Um, and a large part of searching for guests, I mean, a lot of times it's books. You know, someone's written an interesting book that excites my curiosity or Sarah Kroski's curiosity, and we feel that we can sustain an hour-long narrative off the basis of that, whatever that book is. Um, that, that's one part of the show. But the other, those guests, yes, Mary with a dairy in Toowoomba, that, that can be like a suggested to someone through the grapevine, a colleague in the ABC, uh, an email to us. Uh, a lot of guest suggestions we get just aren't right for what we do. A lot of the time we get guest suggestions for some wonderful person who's like a saint in their local community. And I think there's a, an urge to ha have a lot of saints on the show, but I have to resist that temptation. I don't... I think if you ask people, oh, who do you want to hear? Oh, that wonderful person who's doing that incredible thing. But I don't think they'd really want to listen to the show. I think most of us are broken. I don't think many, many of us at all are saints. Uh, and it's those people, though, we found... That this, when we started the show, when I started the show back in 2006, that's when it started, that was... There was an aesthetic and an ethic behind the program, uh, and... The aesthetic was the long form, um, the narrative nature of it, the narrative arc of it, and the ethic was to find people who are largely, unknown, almost entirely unknown in the broader community, who might be well known in their own communities, but largely unknown, uh, who are not famous people. Um, you wouldn't quite call them every day. I just call them unfamous people, uh, extraordinary people, but unfamous people. And very early on, we found that they were the guests the listeners responded to most strongly, because they felt listeners feel they can measure their own lives against it more readily. There is a kind of a thing sometime, in, even in organisations like the ABCs, you get the big interview with the guy <laughs> who does things, and it's me <laughs> and him, and we're going to talk, and it's going to be incredible. <laughs> really? Really? Is it? How often do you ever hear movie stars on my show? Almost never. I, I, we've been offered them and we've said no a few times because mm -hmm. what's the, the... You know when movie stars lead quite boring lives? Mm -hmm. They show up at the set at 6.30am for makeup, then they sit and play PlayStation in their <laughs> Wonder Lodges or Winnebago's for several hours, then they go on set, they say their lines, fuck you, no, fuck you, and then they back, back into the Wonder Lodge, <laughs> back on the PlayStation. That's really the lives most of them lead. They're not particularly interesting people. They don't sustain the hour. The great exception to that is Angela Lansbury 
She mm-hmm. was the great, great, May great, great, amazing Indeed. exception yeah. to that. Um, looking into Angela Lansbury, though, I, as I did my research, uh, I realised she'd never been given a proper interview. I saw an interview she did with Larry King on CNN. And my God, this is a woman who was in the Manchurian Candidate. Mm. She's in Gaslight. Mm. You know, she's in Gaslight. She was in Blue Hawaii with Elvis. Mm. She was a huge Broadway star. Murder, she wrote, yada, yada, yada. She's done all these incredible things. Larry King talked all over her and spoke for longer in the interview than Angela Lansbury did. And I'm sorry, dude with braces, you are like so not interesting compared to the great Angela Lansbury. And, and just giving Angela the chance to tell her story, mm. she completely came to that, rose to the occasion. I was thrilling listening to her. Mm. At the end of it, if you listen to the interv- interview I did with her, I thank her, and then she, you can't hear it, but her eyes filled with tears, and she couldn't say thank you because she choked. She went like that, and she just reached over and held my hand. And that's where the interview ends. And it sounds really weird, it sounds strange because she doesn't say anything Mm. at the end of it, but that's what was going on. Mm. And I didn't want to go, and the reason why she didn't say (laughs) anything because her eyes filled with tears. That was just something I knew then at the time and it was really quite quite lovely, quite lovely. Mm. So yeah, but it's like, she's the great exception. It's It's the people you've never heard of that can bring all this incredible testimonial energy to their own stories. Mm. I'm going to allow just one question down the front and then we'll wrap up. Hello. Hello. Um, Bringing the threads together of all the other questions that we've been asking tonight, um, if you had someone that you could magically resurrect from your book and could have them on conversations, who would it be? Oh, El Masudi, without a doubt. What would you ask, El Masudi? Like the the guy went to medieval um, Constantinople, he'd seen everything. I just, I give over like a month of conversations to him. He's seen everything. And like, he's like, man, you walk the streets of Constantinople. Man, I've been there, I've been there, but it's Istanbul now, man. Man, it's like, and it's, the Hagia Sophia's still there, uh, but there's a mosque there now. You wouldn't believe it. Like, and, and like the Muslim people now run it. You go, really? It'd be amazing. It'd be fantastic. He's so charming and, and funny. And he's, he's, like I say, he's bawdy, um, witty, knowledgeable, wise. Oh, I'd love to meet him. Like I say, one of the great pleasures of, of this period was to encounter a mind like that and have his company. And I thought, oh, why have I never heard of you before? I often think that when I encounter such people like that. And what good company it, it is, how lovely it was to be able to spend, hear their thoughts mm. at a time when we couldn't really go out and meet people. Mm. I want to do two things. I want to thank Richard and thank you. And I want to tell you a little bit about what's coming up next. Um, and I'm going to do them in reverse order because I want to close the night with Richard. Um, thank you all so much for being part of this first event. And we hope if you've loved it, you'll spread the word wide and far. Our next one is March 30th with a wonderful writer from Sydney called Ashley Kalegian Blunt, who's written a psychological thriller. She's a podcaster. She writes about creativity and health. Um, there's going to be a lot to discuss. So we hope to see you there. Um, I, as I mentioned before, the wonderful Berkelau books from Leichhardt are up the back of the room selling not just the book of the Book of Roads and Kingdoms but also Sagaland and Ghost Empire and Golden Maze so we'd love you to go and visit them as well. And it was the kind of custom in medieval Baghdad to buy five copies of a book. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> and he's going to do some calligraphy so, in the front for that's you right. as so well. I'm just saying, yeah. look, there's no yeah. pressure on you but yeah, I'm just yeah. saying yeah. it'd be kind of rude if exactly. you don't. Okay. <laughs> Custom. It's customary, indeed. Um, thank you for mentioning that. I forgot. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to say as well that we are it's very excited as well in May. We're going to partner with the Sydney Writers' Festival and have uh, Robbie Arnott come and speak here, who's written the beautiful Limberlost. So, again, we hope to see you there as well. Um, and if you don't, aren't already, you can sign up to the Petersham Bowling Club newsletter on their website. You can join them on Facebook. You can follow them on Instagram if you're that way inclined. Um, and you can learn more about all the wonderful events that are happening at the PBC. Um, but I wanted to say, Richard, thank you for helping us break the metaphorical bottle of bubbles <laughs> over tonight's inaugural event. Um, but in particular, for taking us back in time, as you do so beautifully, for illuminating the past and reminding us of the long standing exchanges between religions and cultures and the glorious stories and literature that comes from those times. And thank you, thank you all for being part of tonight's event. Here's to many more, and please join me in thanking Richard Feidler. Thank you.